So the 2023 F1 season has been and gone. All 22 races and six sprint races have been started and finished and we can call the season over, which means that for Ferrari fans, they can finally get a few months of not having to cry every Sunday. But of course, the end of the year does mean we can take a look back at how some of the drivers have done, and in particular for this video, some of the ones who have done a little worse than others. Thankfully, there's no Nikita Mazepin or Nicholas Latifi to automatically take the top spot this year, However, that didn't stop a few drivers trying their best. Starting with some honourable mentions, and the first of these slots goes to Kevin Magnussen in the Haas. Now, anyone driving for the Haas team does have a hard task when it comes to F1. However, Kevin did perform well worse of the two. He was both outqualified and outraced by his teammate, being outqualified 15 to 7 and then falling short 9 points to 3 in the season. However, that car was so awful, as per usual, that, well, it's hard to put him any lower because, well, it's Haas. Then the second honourable mention we have is Valtteri Bottas. From going for race wins to trying not to finish last, it has been a bit of a fall in the last couple of years for the Finn. He did do a little bit better than his teammate Joe Guan Yu, which is probably why he only sits in the honourable mentions category. However, it's still nothing more than that. To be honest, the fact that I can't really recall much happening for him really sums up his season as a whole. In fifth place, we have Sergio Perez. Some of you may have put him a little bit higher than this list, even if Sergio himself does say he's the second best driver in the world. <laughs> However, this year it was pretty appalling. Starting off with his qualifying performance, which was one of the worst I've seen from any driver in a number of years watching F1. His average qualifying position was outside the top nine at 9.09. .09. When you consider just how high up his teammate is, it really does put into performance how shocking that qualifying is. The amount of times he was knocked out in Q2 does really show how many times he underperformed in those sessions. The fact that he was behind both Mercedes drivers, Lando Norris, both Ferraris, Fernando Alonso, pretty much anyone who had a good car. It must be said that his race pace was a little better, but when you are in the fastest car on the grid, your goals for Sunday are not to make your way through the pack, but more be at the front and stay at the front a la Max Verstappen. And then obviously we come on to his points totals, finishing with less than half of those from the person who had the most dominant season in F1 history. Well, it's just relatively disappointing. As I say, Sergio's only saving grace in this is that his race pace was generally okay. However, as a season as a whole, qualifying especially, pretty awful. Next up, as my fourth worst driver this year, was Zhou Guan Yu. The fact that we barely even realised he was on the grid really sums up his season as a whole. In fact, the only times I remember him during races was when he'd had an amazing qualifying and then lost something like 10 or 12 positions off the start because, well, he was pretty bad at those. In a way, he was very similar to his teammate Bottas. Neither of them scored that much and neither of them ever really looked like scoring too many more. However, it is fair to say that through qualifying and races, he did do worse than his teammate. And as he's no longer a rookie, you don't really have that extra bit of wiggle room when it comes for judgment of your season. Now moving on to third place, and it's everyone's least favourite Canadian, Lance Stroll. Early on in the year, he did obviously have the excuse of having the bike accident where he broke his wrist, which is very legitimate. However, funnily enough, those were his best races of the year. In those initial stages, he was fighting with the Mercedes and going for decent amounts of points in Saudi Arabia. He was running sort of fifth, maybe sixth place before his car broke down. And then it all just went downhill from there. Ultimately, what he did was when the Aston was at its best, he completely didn't take advantage of it. To the point where if you look at Fernando in the standings, that differential in points in terms of a percentage, besides really Albon and Sargent, is the biggest pretty much in the entire grid for those that have a substantial number to base it on. He was absolutely destroyed by Fernando. Then you take into account things like qualifying, whereas you had Fernando being the seventh highest driver on the grid. Lance Stroll was down there in 14th, averaging just 12.5 for his qualifying position. And remember, that's in a car that was challenging for podiums at multiple times throughout the year. And when you take that car that was challenging for podiums and you look at where it's finished in the end, coming fifth in the constructors, a few more points from Lance Stroll, just at any point really, would have helped Aston Martin to take that place away from McLaren. They didn't finish too far behind and a few good performances would have gone a really long way. The only slight saving grace for Stroll from the season being even more of a disaster than it actually was, is that towards the end of the year he did have a couple of performances that pulled him away from the likes of 
Gasly and the likes of Ocon, there was genuinely a point where it looked like he was going to be outscored by the Alpine drivers. But yeah, for Stroll as a whole, it was a pretty dreadful year. Next up in second place, we have one of the rookies, and that's Logan Sargent. He was the only driver this year to be outscored or outqualified, I should say, by his teammate, 22 to 0, not managing to beat Alex Albon in a single session. He did have some improvement at the end of the year, getting into Q3. However, when you look at the season as a whole, pretty underwhelming. However, there was one category that he did excel at and one statistic that he really made his own, crash damage, as he led the way ahead of everyone else in terms of the amount of damage scores in dollars and the amount of damage that the team would have to fix. So when you take that aside, that's qualifying and crashes, you then get to his race pace, and well, quite frankly, it did sometimes look like Nicholas Latifi was still driving that car. He generally, most of the time, wasn't really anywhere near Albon, and even sometimes wasn't really racing with anyone. As I say, towards the end of the year, it did pick up a little bit, but when you take the season as a whole, even as a rookie, it's some pretty poor pace, some pretty poor qualifying, and you've also smashed the car up quite a bit. If I did have to take one positive from Logan Sargent's season, it was that he did finish with a single point at the end of the year, meaning that he wasn't very last in the Drivers' Championship. However, that one point did only come because Hamilton and Leclerc both got disqualified in the USA because he actually finished 12th. But still, a point's a point. Ultimately though, when your season consists of mainly trying to persuade your own team boss that you deserve a seat, it just kind of sums up how poorly it's gone for you. Normally you want the team going, yeah, we really want to keep you so that we can get some great results and really move forward together rather than, ah, is he going to destroy the car this weekend? So yeah, Logan Sargent, second worst in 2023. And then in first place, we do, of course, have Nick DeVries, the only driver to be replaced mid-season. And even though he's a Red Bull driver and these things do happen, we've seen a number of drivers, even as rookies, who haven't been replaced mid-season. I mean, even Nikita Mazepin managed that. However, looking back at the move, when you see what Daniel Ricciardo did and Liam Lawson did when he came in, you can't really disagree with it. As ultimately for Nick, he was driving incredibly slow, so far off the back of the pack at times, really in a race of his own, and then you couple that with the fact that he also crashed. You look at places like Australia, there were incidents, Baku especially, where he crashed both in qualifying and then in the race as well, and you combine those two things together and it's the golden combination for getting rid of a driver. If I had to liken it to anyone else in recent times, it would be Mick Schumacher in 2022, where the pace wasn't really quite there, and he was crashing. For the case of Nick De Vries, it was both slow and damage, not the combination that Alfa Tauri would be looking for. And to top it all off, he was the driver that finished 22nd in a 20-car championship, having been beaten by Liam Lawson, who had just four races. So there you have my worst drivers of 2023. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and if you think I've missed anyone out or put anyone in the wrong order. But until next time, take care.